Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Longmont City Council debates produced by Longmont Public Media in partnership with the League of Women Voters and sponsored by Sustainable Resilient Longmont. This is the Ward 1 debate, and I am your host, Faith Halverson Ramos. In alphabetical order from left to right are candidates Diane Christ, Harrison Earl, and Nia Wasink. I will call on each candidate to give a one minute opening statement and we ask that the audience remain silent during the debate and make sure that your phone is off or in airplane mode. So candidate Christ, your opening statement. Thank you, Faith. I'm Diane Christ, your Ward 1 candidate. In 2021, I brought you the Hyperloop. As the Vice Chair of Longmont's Transportation Board, we initiated Vision Zero and a privately run microtransit program within the city. My focus this year is bringing back the Longmont we love. I would like the city to rent blighted buildings for expanded recreation and library services, that way bringing it to multiple neighborhoods. Every ward has at least one large empty building. Placing city services in community commercial centers will build area business and a sense of community. Mead is building an RV park on Highway 66. Attracting these tourism dollars to North Longmont businesses must be a priority in the next year. As a business development accountant and budget expert, my knowledge and expertise is needed on the council at this time. Our taxpayer approved 2021 projects have been stalled due to inflation. We need to put off voting on any new projects until the actual costs are understood. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Thank you, Faith, and hello, everyone. My name is Harrison Earl, and I'm running for City Council to push for an affordable, livable, and sustainable Longmont. I've lived in Longmont for the past six years, and I love it here. I know what a special place this is, and I know how much that all of us believe that. My wife, Elizabeth, is a family medicine physician at Salud Family Health Centers here in town. Together with our golden doodle, Maximus, we enjoy exploring Longmont's trails, greenways, and recognize what a tremendous asset they, along with our parks, are for the community. I've worked in the aviation industry for the last 15 years. Currently, I work as a consultant helping airports around the country. And I've used that experience to help Longmont, being appointed to the Airport Advisory Board five years ago, and I've been serving as chair for the last three years. I've worked hard to bring economic benefits to our city and work collaboratively with our city staff to all of our benefit. Should I be elected, I pledge to represent not a specific party or special interest, but all of the residents of Longmont. I'll serve with honesty, integrity, and respect, and promise to bring common sense to a city council. I'm really proud to run so that I can fight for an affordable, livable, and sustainable Longmont. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. Thank you, Faith, and thanks LPM and League of Women Voters for helping facilitate this and SRL for sponsoring. My name is Nia Wasink, my pronouns are she, her, and I am honored to be running for your Ward 1 City Council representative. I've spent my entire career in service to my community. I worked directly in nonprofits and then started my own consulting firm supporting nonprofits. We do strategic planning, governance, fundraising, and help build capacity. Through that work, we kept having uh, clients that came up with the same problems over and over again. There's only so much we can do in direct service. We need policy solutions to help serve our community. That's why I'm running for your Longmont City Council. I want to ensure that we have a Longmont where people find inclusion, belonging, where we can foster diversity, and we can ensure that everybody can thrive. Thank you for your statements. Next, I will read the rules of the debate and ask the first question of candidate Diane Christ. The candidate on the left will be asked the first question, which they have one minute to answer. When the answer is finished or their one minute is up, each of the other participants has 30 seconds to rebut or extend the first answer. Rebuttals move left to right, beginning on the answerer's right and moving round robin. When all candidates have spoken, the candidate to the answerer's right becomes the next answerer. I will then ask a new question of the next answerer and rebuttals proceed as before. At the 25 minute mark, the current round of question and rebuttals is completed and the lightning round begins. In the lightning round, each candidate answers the same question 
with a one word answer. Five questions will be asked and we'll start from right to left for the first question, left to right for the second question for the lightning round. When the lightning round is over, the second half of the debate begins. It proceeds as the same as the first round, except the first answerer will be the rightmost candidate, Nia, and the round, round robin proceeds right to left. At the 55 minute mark, the debate ends after the current round of question and rebuttals is completed. I will then call on the candidates right to left to make a one minute closing statement. So, to begin, I'll choose our first question that will first be answered by candidate Christ and then answered by candidate Earl. So our first question is, should the city spend taxpayer money on lawsuits in pursuit of changes in state law? Should the city sign on to public actions brought by other jurisdictions? Well, that's an interesting question, Faith. I believe that government is a servant, not a master. And as council members, we're here to administrate taxpayer intent and in dollars in ways that represent the citizens of Longmont. I do exactly this as a business uh, consultant with the businesses I represent. And I will be a good steward of your hard earned dollars. Government should do for individuals what they cannot do for themselves. And luckily we are very capable people. If we did everything our U.S. Constitution demands of us, life would be beautiful indeed. It's not the role of city council to run contrary to other laws, and especially not the supreme law of the land. So I would say, following, following other, other municipalities and other initiatives against laws is not a good use of taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Well, thank you. It, it's hard to talk in these hypotheticals and generalities, but I do think there's some say, cases where the city needs to stand up and support what's right and fight for that. Sometimes that means doing things like lawsuits or joining other municipalities, but I also think it's really important to recognize the fact that when a city is taking that action, we're spending all of our money as taxpayers to support those lawyers and those legal fees. And so it really needs to be deliberate and done when it is prudent and in the best interest of all of us. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. Yeah, I would just extend what Harrison has said and uh, agree it's hard in a hypothetical situation to say any kind of blanket statement. Um, I think every opportunity we have to support and protect our community members, uh, we should take. Um, and we need to evaluate each opportunity um, to ensure that it's providing the most good for the people of Longmont. Uh, if that does require a lawsuit or um, extending with other jurisdictions, then we absolutely should be doing that. Thank you. Our next question will be answered first by candidate Earl, followed by candidate Wasink. What would you do to enlist residents of Longmont more in keeping our city crime free? So I'd start by saying I really support the work that our public safety department does overall. Um, I've had a chance to sit down with the public safety chief, the police chief, and the fire chief and respect the work that they and their staff do. I think it's really important that our public safety staff is integrated into the community, that it, they're trusted by members of the community that they are at events, like so many of them were at Unity in the Community last night, um, that they're engaging with nonprofits, they're in the community organizations, so that people recognize them not as an outside law enforcement, but as Longmonters and as people who they trust and can go to. And I think that trust is where we start so that we can bring people in the room, people willing to stand up and help work collaboratively to make sure that the city is a very safe place for all of us. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I think community-based solutions are actually one of the most effective ways we can address some of the safety concerns. I'm gonna take the example of Lanyon Park. Um, 
in, in that case, the neighborhood was concerned about safety um, and the, the park began to fall into disrepair. Uh, together with our community services team at the city, the neighborhood came together, started bringing programming back, started revitalizing that area, and reclaiming that park for the neighborhood. Those are the kinds of solutions that are really based in community building. Thank you. Our next question will be one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Apologies, Candidate okay. Christ. So, we need a better police presence in neighborhoods. Currently, only one of our police officers lives in Longmont. And the police officers should be prioritized for attainable housing um, so that they and uh, doesn't necessarily have to be our officers, but just a public safety officer, you know, like a state patrol or from another town. Their presence in a community will help inhibit crime. Thank you. Now our next question <laughs> will first be answered by candidate Wasink, followed by candidate Christ. And that question is, the mayor typically represents Longmont on the board of the Platte River Power Authority, but any council member may be appointed to serve on the board. If you were a board member, would you work to reduce PRPA's investment in generation facilities that burn fossil fuels? Yes, absolutely. Um, PRPA's goal on going fully renewable by 2030 is a really important one for us to maintain. Um, and obviously, PRPA has a number of different municipalities paying into it. Um, I think whether or not, as a council person, I sit on the board, we all have a role to play um, in talking to them about some of the strategies for the 100% renewable goal. We have some significant outreach that needs to happen with our community members. Um, we're, we're talking about serious behavior change and how we actually utilize energy in our homes. So that's the kind of work that I would love to be engaged with, actually talking to community members, talking about their needs, and ensuring that they're really fully educated on what this energy transition means for us. Thank you. Candidate Chris. The truth is that parts of Longmont are underpowered electrically. And some of that is in Ward 1, where the neighborhoods were built in the 1980s. In talking with Electrify Longmont, the truth is that they cannot go coal-free by 2030. And it's questionable whether they can make it by 2040. So I think we have to ease out of this, and we have to be patient. Change takes time sometimes, and also sometimes arrives on its own schedule. Thank you. Candidate Earl. I think it's really important that we do continue on the path with PRPA to reduce investment in generation of fossil fuels and move towards carbon zero generation by 2030. I also think it's very important that we do so um, in a way that doesn't overburden our residents, our rate payers, with significant rate increases. That we continue investments in things like efficiency works that provides rebates and provides resources to people so that we're all prepared for that transition and can do so in a way that's fair and equitable to all of us. Thank you. Our next question will be first asked, answered by candidate Chris. And that question is, <clears throat> Do you believe that density increases for infill development should be limited to a percentage of density over adjacent neighborhoods? Hmm. She's asking me a math question. It's fun. I think, I think there's a couple of issues here. For one, um, the city has a housing inclusion, or inclusionary housing uh, measure of 12% on, on um, high density housing or actually on all housing development. And so I think there's the push sometimes to build more units. But I also think that neighborhoods should be considered in terms of the style and contiguousness to the development. Um, it seems like 10 years ago we were building apartment complexes that very easily fit into the neighborhood. Now. I see, see some that are, are starkly in contrast to the neighborhood. We need to work to where everyone is satisfied. 
Uh, like I said, government is a ser servant, not a master, and our citizens all need to be satisfied with their neighborhoods. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Thank you. My number one issue in my campaign is housing affordability, and I think it's really important to recognize that one of the ways we're going to bring down housing prices is to build more housing, and that does involve more density. Now, I don't think that we should have a hard and fast rule about density as a percentage, but I'd like to look at what the infrastructure is nearby. So we're able to go denser along some of our major arterial streets, like Main Street, like um, Pace or 17th. Um, and we're not going as dense in neighborhoods or where the infrastructure, transportation, and resources aren't there. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I'd really like to uplift the recent charrette process that took place for the Bond Farm development. It was an opportunity for the neighborhood to come to the table and say, here are our concerns uh, with the design, the density, um, any kind of changes that they were expecting to experience in their neighborhood, and the developers to come to the table with what their needs were. And through that came about with a compromise that was um, presented in the concept plan. Those kinds of processes of community engagement and finding compromises is where we really need to go in terms of our density discussions. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question will be first answered by candidate Earl, and it is, should Longmont change all residential zoning to mixed use? Why or why not? <laughs> So it's a, I think, kind of a loaded question. No, I don't think we should change all residential zoning to mixed use. Should we change some residential zoning to mixed use? Yes. Should there be multiple types of mixed use that have different um, densities associated with them? Again, depending on the infrastructure, yes. I think it's really important that we do build more housing in Longmont. Um, and I think that means densifying our existing neighborhoods. That doesn't mean putting up big apartment buildings or complexes in the middle of single family neighborhoods but it means things like duplexes or some townhomes. It means more condos, and it means things that help preserve the character of neighborhoods while also bringing down the cost of housing and making it affordable to live here. City Council has a role in that with updating zoning rules, with updating building codes. Um, the state also has a role in that with things like construction defect laws that let us do more of that building. And so I think that our city council should act on what we can and should advocate loudly and um, we should advocate loudly for those changes that need to happen on the state level to make sure we're fighting for our residents. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I agree that um, a blanket change to our zoning across the city doesn't make sense. And I also want to clarify the difference between upzoning, allowing for higher density on a unit versus mixed use. Um, mixed use would allow for a lot of other um, types of structures to be built. Um, and those types of things really need to go in front of city council and ensure that we're thinking through the impacts of that on the neighborhood, on the community, and on our infrastructure. Thank you. Candidate Chris. A better sense of community is a good place to start. And I think this should be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Two of the methods that we have for creating affordable housing are inclusive housing measures and ADUs. Now in Ward 1 we have a lot of ADU opportunity in that many uh, single family homes were actually zoned for duplexes and so many people do rent out part of their home. And more of that would be helpful. Thank you. Our next question will be answered by candidate Wasink first, and it is, describe how you see the role of municipal government paying particular attention to whether protecting individual rights versus ensuring that vulnerable populations are not left behind is more important. I see the role of government as um, multifaceted. There's the basic service provision, um, our basic infrastructure, access to sewer, water. Um, there's the quality of life measures, access to our parks and open space. And then there's the really critical work to ensure that the most vulnerable amongst us aren't uh, thrust deeper <clears throat> into tragedy. Um, that can look like our building codes, codes ensuring that people ha are able to live in safe, stable environments. Um, it's the incentive programs that we provide to ensure that we're getting additional housing. Um, and it's also looking at things like minimum wages and ensuring that we're able to create a, an environment where people can not just live but thrive. 
Um, the really important role of our city government is to ensure that all of that is done with an equitable lens, that we are really thinking about the, the impacts um, across racial lines, gender, um, sexual orientation, to again ensure that uh, oppressed peoples aren't further hurt by our regulations. Thank you. Candidate Christ. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Describe how you see the role of municipal government paying particular attention to whether protecting individual rights versus ensuring that vulnerable populations are not left behind is more important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I believe City Council is really an administrator for taxpayers for their um, intent and also for their dollars. Something I've observed in Longmont before is the better that all of Longmont does, the better the vulnerable population does. And I think that's the way forward. The more we focus on our positives, on our success, on building business, the better everyone in town will do and the more other, people's, other people have to contribute to functions that help others. Thank you. Candidate Earl. I think it's important to remember that government at all levels is of the people, for the people, and by the people. We work for, we, if we were elected city council, work for you, the residents. And it's important that we stand up for individual rights, but it's equally important we protect those whose rights are being violated. Um, it's been explained to me in constitutional law classes, and I'm not a lawyer, so excuse the you know, poor description, the right to swing your fist stops when it gets close to someone else's face. And I think that's really important in the way we think about protecting people. Yes, we all have our own individual rights. We can't use that to hurt anybody in the process. Thank you. Our next question will be answered first by candidate Christ. And it is, <clears throat> council members receive many complaints about noise and danger caused by street racing during the summer months. Is this just a part of life in Longmont? What policy changes would you support to reduce this problem? Well, that's an interesting question. I did mention I'm the vice chair of the transportation board. Uh, I think that's a, a, a need for more community. I think one of the things our, our young people in town are missing is a place to hang out. We used to have a mall and we don't have that anymore. Um, I should say, we don't have an indoor mall where you can hang out and just hang out with your friends. But um, having a community commercial center, someplace where you can take your kids, take them to the recreation center while, you know, as the mom maybe goes and gets groceries or, you know, goes to the salon, and then you can pick them up later. But it gives them that private time with their friends where they're actually in a community center. They're they have other people around, it's fairly safe, it's an epicenter that the police can, can easily drive by and keep, a, keep an eye on what's going on. I think that's what's missing right now in the fabric and structure of our neighborhoods, and I think that would help everybody um, find an outlet for, for the engagement that they're looking for by racing in the street. Thank you. Candidate Earl. The question is if street racing is it inevitable, just a part of life in Longmont? No, it really shouldn't be. Um, I don't disagree with Diane. I do think there's some community involved there, but I also think there there is need for more enforcement. There um, is things like the police's um, radar cameras, or sorry, not radar cameras, but the devices that show you their speed that are connected in, so they see in real time what's happening across the city and can respond to it. And it is things like decibel meters that actually allow them to enforce the codes that are already existing. I think that's an important part of it, um, and I think it's something that they need to be prioritizing a little bit more. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I think as we continue on our path towards Vision Zero, um, monitoring our streets and streets being utilized in unsafe ways is an inevitable part of that. Um, to that same end though, I'm hearing from community members that they are opting to not go on our streets during certain times of the day because of the fear of street racing. So while we work on enforcement, we also need to ensure that we're providing transportation options that meet their needs. Our, our new microtransit grant is actually a really fantastic step towards that um, and will also help with their transportation needs more holistically. Thank you. That concludes our question and answer portion, the first part, and now we're going to move on. <laughs> we're gonna move, move on to the lightning round, a little palate cleanser. Um, we'll start with candidate 
uh, candidate Wasink first, and then candidate Earl. Have you ever ridden a city bus? Yes. Yes. And then candidate Christ. Absolutely. And now, starting with candidate Christ, Sands or Costco? Oh, both. Costco. <laughs> Costco. Okay. <laughs> Candidate Wasink, would you ban plastic straws if you could? No. Yes. No. Okay. Candidate Christ, should Longmont freeze annexations of land? Yes. No. No. Okay. Last question, Candidate Wasink, what would be your vehicle of choice if money were no object? <laughs> Dog sled. <laughs> I, I'd really love an Audi EV. Hyperloop. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So now we are about to enter in our second half of question answer. We're going to begin with candidate Wasink and then candidate Earl. Should Longmont change its electric rate structure to encourage more people to install solar panels on their homes or commercial buildings? Why or why not? That's an interesting concept. Um, I certainly am all for whatever we can do in terms of incentive structures to get more individuals using renewable energies. Um, obviously, we have this investment as a city through PRPA, uh, but we have individual opportunities as well. Um, so I, it's definitely something I'd look into and consider. Um, I, I think we also just need to ensure, though, again, that we're thinking about some of the most vulnerable folks in our community. So if we're changing rate structures, how can we ensure that low-income families aren't negatively impacted at that same time? Thank you. Candidate Earl. So when you talk to the folks at LPC, they, they think that the current rate structure, the net metering, is actually incredibly valuable for solar and that any revisions they bring are likely to make it less beneficial um, because it's, it's almost too generous right now. I think it's really important, as Nia mentioned, to think about equity and the rate structure right now is not super equitable to everybody. And so I'd like to see us move more towards incentives um, and rebates through efficiency works or other avenues as a way to encourage solar rather than looking strictly at a rate structure. Thank you. Candidate Christ. That's a great answer, Harrison. Thanks. I think solar is a great, uh, great tool, but I think it should be a private decision whether you use solar. And um, I think real environmental gains uh, will be achieved from technology changes in transportation. We're talking about the Hyperloop because we just mentioned it, but um, moving cargo through the Hyperloop, the emission savings are going to be massive. And Virgin Hyperloop in California is working on that right now. Thank you. Next question will be answered first by candidate Earl. And it is, should Longmont build a shelter for homeless people who live on the streets? Do you think that this could eliminate or dramatically reduce homelessness in Longmont? Yes, Longmont should invest in a shelter for homeless people in Longmont. Um, I think it's really important that when we think about those experiencing homelessness, we start with the fact that they're human beings and need to be treated with decency and respect, and we provide them services so that they can get through a rough patch in their life and move into more permanent housing. Now, I would rather see Longmont partner with our other communities in Boulder County to do something on a county-wide basis that works to help people rather than Longmont pursue its own goal, Boulder pursue its own goal, and that we're able to therefore have more resources available to people, um, be able to have mental health addiction services, um, financial counseling, help with down payments, rent assistance, kind of all in one roof that serves the entire county. I'd, I'd rather see that approach, but I think Longmont absolutely should put our resources and our funding into a shelter and into helping those experiencing homelessness and help them move into permanent housing. Thank you. Candidate Christ. I liked your answer, Harrison. Uh, Longmont does need a place for homeless to sleep. Loveland has had success with churches, um, and they've been taking turns providing supervised sleeping areas for local homeless, and um, donations then uh, fund or directly uh, to participate 
either in a fund or directly to participating churches would help develop this program in Longmont. Thank you. Canada Wasink. Having just come uh, from HOPE's fundraiser, um, our primary homeless services organization here in Longmont, it's very clear that a permanent shelter location is absolutely needed. Right now we are reliant on the generosity of churches to provide those services. I want to be really clear though that providing emergency shelter in and of itself is not going to actually address homelessness. We need the full spectrum of support, um, like substance use treatment, behavioral health, um, support with stability. We also need the transitional housing and permanent supportive housing like the in-between can provide. Thank you. Our next question will be answered first by candidate Christ, followed by candidate Wasink. The state of Colorado pays for 10 hours of early childhood education for 440s. How do we help parents with the rest? You know, I was just speaking with the, um, the members of the R Center, and they were talking about uh, their provided daycare, uh, and what they, were what they were concerned about is that they have a hard time finding teachers. So I think, you know, we tend to look at these uh, problems and think of micro solutions, but I think the solutions actually need to come uh, from a macro lens. I don't think it's just enough to provide more money or provide more um, incentives to families. I think we have to look at systematically why do we not have adequate childcare in our town and what actually would work for families. Now, I raised four children, and I know how hard it is to find good daycare, but I did have success um, finding it in my neighborhood, and that worked, um, that really worked the best. It was private providers. And uh, it was interesting because we could work out deals, you know, maybe um, she needed my services and I would help her with, with her accounting sometimes. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I'm very honored to be a part of the Early Childhood Alliance that was looking towards larger solutions. Uh, we proposed a special district that would have infused tens of thousands of dollars, uh, sorry, tens of millions of dollars <laughs> into our early childhood environment here in Boulder County. Um, unfortunately, that measure has not moved forward. Uh, we will continue to fight for that. At the same time, the city has opportunities. They're currently partnering with TLC Learning Center to create a hub, uh, and we have many other providers that need additional support in their direct provision of early child care. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the Early Childhood Alliance. I think that's a phenomenal place to start with. But I also think this question started with the state of Colorado and the state of Colorado only providing 10 hours. And so I want to kick it back to our legislators in Denver. This is a statewide problem. This is not unique to Longmont. And so, you know, Diane, if we're talking macro solutions, which I love, let's focus on the statewide level. Let's do more to get people into the pipeline of teachers. Let's fund it more. And let's do things to help families all over the state, including those here in Longmont. Thank you. This next question will first be answered by candidate Wasink and then candidate Christ. The question is, council members are often asked by residents, why, why weren't we allowed to vote on this or that issue? In your opinion, is the policy balance between what is put to popular vote and what is decided by elected representatives about right? Or do we have too many votes? Or is council too powerful? Mm. Big question. That's a big one, yeah. Mm. <laughs> but I'll take it. Um, you know, I think, first off, I want to make sure that it's really clear that many of the measures that are on our ballot is actually because of TABOR. We have to send to the voters tax measures. That has to be voted on directly. Um, so many of the other items that are referred, um, it, it, actually, in, on this year's ballot, you really won't see any. Um, I think what's more important, though, is really the community engagement. Um, as council members, I think it's incumbent upon us to do direct community engagement and not just engage with those who show up for public comment, because to show up to public comment at a city council meeting requires a certain level of privilege. We need to be out in the community as council members, hearing directly from the individuals and the organizations doing the work. And then we can also ensure that we have sufficient time to bring those voices into the council chambers and have really well-informed decisions. Thank you. Candidate Christ. Could you ask that question again? Please? Yes. 
Council members are often asked by residents, why weren't we allowed to vote on this or that issue? In your opinion, is the policy balance between what is put to popular vote and what is decided by elected representatives about right? Or do we have too many votes? Or is council too powerful? I think when we're talking about why didn't we get a chance to vote on that, they're talking about policy changes that happen in, um, during council meetings. And I would say that um, often the council meetings go long and it is tough for people to meet all the public invited to be heard. I would also say that um, often um, the packet information, you know, just comes out like this morning for Tuesday's meeting and people don't have an adequate time to fully review the information. Sometimes those packets are 700 pages long. Thank you. Candidate Earl. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing here, that we, 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 we do think that the balance of power is more or less correct. Um, I, I think one thing that would be really important, as both Nia and Diane have alluded to, is things like changing meeting times and varying them so that people have the ability to come provide input. Um, it is things like making sure that council members have open office hours and are accessible to members of the community and be able to hear that feedback um, and recognize that if there is something very controversial, that we need to have extra outreach and be able to hear feedback in advance of any vote. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you. Our next question will be first answered by candidate Christ, followed by candidate Wasink. And the question is, should Longmont install public, or should Longmont install parking meters to reduce traffic <clears throat> congestion downtown? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. I'll tell you that businesses do not like parking meters. And the reason why businesses don't like parking meters is they think it's going to keep people from uh, participating or in, in their functions or shopping at their stores. The truth is that uh, parking meters actually encourage customers to get in, get what they need done, and leave um, so that they beat the meter. So there's actually more turnover of customers when parking meters are installed. It actually turns out that uh, businesses can do better with parking meters. Uh, it is, uh, parking is a really big expense for the city. And so uh, it is one measure that the city can use. It's, it's a more of a use tax. In other words, you don't pay for it unless you use it. So uh, it is one effective way to manage those costs for the transportation department. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. Yeah, I think we've got um, a few different things happening here. Um, as candidate Chris alluded to, uh, there are definitely concerns that I'm hearing from businesses. If we move to parking meters, people will spend less time downtown. Um, so I think it's also about a behavioral shift. We have a parking garage on Collier that folks can use to spend significantly more time in their downtown area. I was there last night for unity in the community and people are fighting for parking. And I drove up to the second floor of that parking garage and parked straight away. So we need to continue to ensure that folks are thinking about parking downtown differently. Thank you. Candidate Earl. So I'd like to expand this beyond parking. I, I don't necessarily think parking meters are the, the answer downtown, um, but clearly there also is a lack of parking and I'd like to address that through other transportation methods. Make it safer to bike downtown, to walk downtown. Systems like a bike share in Longmont that we haven't had for years and really didn't reach the corners of the city when it did. Um, and it is about expanding our bus network. You can't take a bus downtown, even if you happen to live on, a, on one of the lines, for the evening. The buses stop running at 5 and 6 p.m. That stuff needs to be changed, and I really think our microtransit is one way to do that. Thank you. Our next question will first be answered by candidate Earl, then candidate Chris. And that question is, we are in an ozone non-compliance area. Can you explain what that means and how should Longmont do its part to reduce ozone levels locally? I'm going to do my best to explain what that means. <laughs> um, that is not my area of expertise, but my understanding from what I've read is it means we're out of compliance with the federal guidelines uh, around ozone and around pollutants in the air. And so I think what's you know, where we start with that as Longmont is making sure that we're providing tools and incentives for our residents, our businesses, to reduce our emissions. Um, that goes with our 2030 goal to get out of 
um, carbon power to get out of the coal generation business. It does include uh, increased solar. It includes electrifying homes to get out of natural gas. And all of that needs some incentives and needs to be able to be done equitably. Um, often what comes up is actions like getting gas cars off the road or moving away from gas uh, lawn and yard equipment. And I think we do need to be moving towards an electric future. I support that. But I really don't think this is you know, talking about a blanket ban on that. But it is about a transition and working over time to make sure that we're reducing our emissions. Thank you. Candidate Christ. I need you to read that question again. Yes. We are in an ozone non-compliance area. Can you explain what that means and how should Longmont do its part to reduce ozone levels locally? Okay, I think Harrison described the ozone com complex problem the best. <laughs> so I'm going to skip over that and say that one of the things that's affecting us is one, our altitude, and two, our weather in, in terms of we have inversions in the winter. Something we can do to fix that is we can create the commu community commercial centers I'm talking about because the idea is that you have short trips within your neighborhood and you're able to do five things while you're there, condensing five trips into one, which would help our emissions and our ozone. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I'm going to thank Harrison for taking one for the team. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> and say I actually very much agree with uh, much of what he said. Um, and instead talk about what happens when we don't know the answers. Um, as a city council person, there will absolutely be topics that we are not as well versed in. For me, it's about reaching out to community organizations. I would immediately call my friends at Sustainable Resilient Longmont and get their perspectives on what we should be doing, getting policy recommendations, and then going out to the community to hear directly from our, our residents about what's needed in Longmont. Thank you. Our next question will be answered first by candidate Wasink and then candidate Earl. And the question is, do you support a camping ban within the city of Longmont? Absolutely not. And now I'll explain. Uh, camping bans divert resources from actual solutions. Um, and we've seen this in surrounding towns when they, they put money into public safety to move people from spaces, from theoretically public spaces. What we're saying with the camping ban is those are public spaces for certain people. What we need to be doing, again, is investing in resources, investing in places where people can go to get the support they need. We have amazing community organizations. The Our Center ensures that folks have stability, so hopefully they don't enter into homelessness. We have hope that helps people get out of homelessness and ensure that those times spent are short um, and infrequent. Those are the programs that we need to be investing in. If we're having issues in our parks, we can work with public safety to find alternative solutions. Again, I'm going to bring up Lanyon Park, where they installed lights, um, which allowed the neighborhood to feel much more safe in those spaces. Camping bans do not solve the problem, and we need to invest in solutions that do. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Yeah, I appreciate the kind words after the last one, so I'll, re I'll return the favor here. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think we need camping bans in Longmont. Um, and, and I really think it goes back to those extra resources. And as I talked about earlier in a shelter, I think it's something we need to look at regionally. Um, I think a camping ban encourages, say, moving a problem, moving people, human beings, from Longmont to Boulder, for example, or other communities. And that's really not the right way to help people and get them on the path towards permanent housing and out of a very rough time in their life. So no, I don't think a camping ban is the right way to approach this. I don't think it's worth criminalizing uh, those experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Candidate Chris. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say to Nia, I agree with you that anything with um, the homeless is a temporary solution until they're housed. Um, one of the things about camping is it is a temporary solution, and um, I don't see a, a problem with utilizing it. They're building an RV park in Mead, and um, there could be coupons, what have you, to go and, and stay camp there. But also, we have some really beautiful spots um, all along our Weld County Road where we could marry that idea with parking meters and um, have some very affordable parking for camping vans. Thank you. Our next question will first be answered by candidate Earl, then candidate Christ. And the question is, 
What would you do to ensure that Longmont's highly marginalized trans community feels safe in their hometown? It's a good question. I'm probably not going to have a firm answer here, um, but I'll tell you a little story. When I was in college, one of the friends I met on my freshman floor um, came out to me within the first couple weeks as trans, and this was the first trans person I had ever met in my life. Um, he did not have a community at the college, did, I think, felt a little uncertain. And one of the things that I did along with another friend is we went to the residential life group and actually got the three of us to live together in a suite that is you know, technically mixed sex, but did not feel like that to us. It was just friends living together and supporting him um, in a way that really worked for him. Now, I don't know what those things are that the trans community in Longmont would want to see specifically, but I'm an ally. And I would like to use that exact same approach that I did with my friend to all of my friends in the trans community and more broadly in any community in Longmont who feels marginalized to make sure they feel like they're at home here in Longmont and that they're supported, loved, and that they belong. Thank you. Candidate Christ. That was a very sensitive answer. Uh, I don't know if people are aware, but uh, we've been doing trans surgeries for many years. Um, primarily started down in Trinidad, Colorado. So we've had trans individuals in our community for a long time. I think it's about diversity. Uh, it can be complicated when people are different than you. So I think that's really a diversity question. And nicely, in Ward 1, which we're all candidates uh, for Ward 1, we have a multicultural uh, neighborhood in most of Ward 1. So I think um, this is something that we see, would um, more easily embrace. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. So first and foremost, to any trans individuals watching or uh, friends of trans individuals, please know that I'm here to support you and ensure your safety. Um, we know Boulder County is not immune to the anti-trans hate that we've seen across the country. And especially trans women of color are the most likely to be harmed. We have advocates in the trans community who are currently pushing for a human rights committee just to ensure we have a place to deal with this at the city. What our trans community needs, I am there for and will wholeheartedly support. Thank you. Our next question will be answered by candidate Christ and then followed by candidate Wasink. And the question is, should the city subsidize training for in-home childcare providers? Also, another good question. I'm not a big fan of subsidies. However, um, if you have a plan and you have uh, a timeline for how long that's going to be and you have goals in mind, oftentimes those programs can work very effectively. I think what becomes difficult is when you have a training program and you don't, you know, you're just kind of um, wishy-washy about it. You don't know how many people you're trying to, to put out there to, to take care of children and you don't know what the goals should be and you don't know how long that should go on and who should be doing the training. So I'm saying all those are typical things that we should think about before we consider subsidizing. Um, that being said, it's important that child care is safe and affordable and also that there's some consistency in um, the way child care occurs. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. So I just want to follow that up to say that we, there are training curriculum um, that have been developed, that have been verified and evaluated. Um, two of our statewide providers of those programs are actually clients of mine, and so I know that they work. Um, providing that kind of training to what we call FFN, family, friend, neighbor care, is really important not just in terms of ensuring we have the full bevy of early childhood, but ensuring we're doing it in culturally responsive ways. Certain communities prefer to educate their young kids at home, and we should be there to support that. Thank you. Candidate Earl. This is a topic I don't know as much about as, as Nia clearly does. I, I applaud that answer. Um, but I would say, look, as, as we talk about childcare, and we've talked about this earlier, I think it's really important that we do um, provide support. We do su provide training and that we help bring more providers into the child care system because that is a considerable hurdle in getting care, not just the cost, which we've talked about, not just the availability of facilities, but also having the appropriate staff that is well-trained, has the right resources, and can help um, 
really help go through early childhood education correctly. Thank you. The next question <laughs> is uh, the covenants of homeowners associations or HOAs can offer often overrule city code. <clears throat> do you concur with this practice? How would you work to change it, or why do you think it's appropriate the way it is? Is it me? Who's starting? <laughs> Let's start with you, candidate Chris. Okay. This is a tough one for me. I've heard uh, both pros and cons about HOAs, and I've had some experience with them, and I, I am conflicted about it. I think HOAs are good in terms of uh, organizing neighborhood watches and, and bringing a community together. I think it becomes a little bit of a policing society sometimes. And also, we've had some difficulty with the HOAs um, just budging on installing solar, budging on xeriscaping the yards. You know, they, they have uh, these covenants, and sometimes they get out of, out of time with what's going on, and um, they're hard to change once that happens. <sighs> so, um, gosh, I could go either way on this, and I, I guess I would like to hear more from communities that have them. I, my neighborhood does not have an HOA, so... Um, we don't have that particular problem in my neighborhood, but I know others that, that do. So I would like to hear their, um, the constituents' response to how they feel about their HOA. Thank you. Candidate Wasink. I think my red flag antenna always, always goes up when I hear that we've got groups that are trying to overrule our, our city's ordinances. I would definitely want to know more about any specific examples of that. Um, before making a definitive answer. Um, I did hear recently from a supporter that their HOA was barring them from utilizing yard signs. Um, and we've seen um, actually Supreme Court cases about First Amendment that allows for that. So those kind of constitutional rights being infringed upon by HOAs is also a concern um, and something that I think we should be discussing at City Council. Thank you. Candidate Earl. I live at an HOA, so I, I've, I have experience dealing with our HOA board. Um, Luckily, it's run by wonderful neighbors and they do a great job. But I do think it's really a problem if they are allowed to be in conflict with our city code, city building laws, and our ordinances, and that's something we should address. I'd say more broadly, something that's concerned me that came up at a Tuesday City Council meeting is the comment that given the city's lack of investment in new development, that any new development is likely to be an HOA. And I think it's something we need to go back to the drawing board so that we're not forcing that model on any new developments. Thank you. That concludes our second and final question and answer portion of today's debate. Nice. And now is an opportunity for each of the candidates to give a one minute closing statement. And we'll begin with candidate Wasink. Wonderful. Well, if you're still watching, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm exhausted. I'm sure you might be as well. Um, but I really appreciate the time. The, the civic engagement of our voters is so critical for the future success of our community. Um, I do have some pretty amazing colleagues up here uh, with some very specific expertise. I think the difference you're gonna get if you vote for me is my entire career being spent in community service. I know about the community organizations doing the work because I'm working alongside them. I've been on boards where I've directly addressed homelessness. I'm a governance trainer, so I can help ensure that our city council is working effectively and efficiently. Those are the skills that I look forward to bringing forth to council, while also utilizing the community engagement that I do every day in my day job. Um, that's the kind of work that ensures that your voice is heard. I haven't been able to talk about accessibility of city government in tonight's debate, and that's a really critically important thing. I really encourage you to go to my website, find me on social media, Nia for Longma, where you can learn more about how our city government works. Thank you. Candidate Earl. Well, thank you all for watching. Thank you to Longmont Public Media and the League of Women Voters for putting on tonight's debate, and thank you, Faith, for moderating and keeping us all on topic. Thank you, Nia, Diane. I really appreciate the discussion tonight and to all the candidates and all the debates today. Um, I think we're all grateful that Longmont has so many amazing candidates willing to stand up and uh, look for the chance to represent our city. And to everyone watching, thank you for your engagement and trying to be active and informed voters. As I really hope you've seen from my answers tonight, I'm focused on a common sense approach, not on sound bites or talking points. I'm pushing for real, relevant, and attainable policies that our city council can adopt to make Longmont even better. 
There's a whole lot we didn't talk about tonight. There's obviously a lot more nuance in this, so I'd invite you to visit my website, harrisonforlongmont.com. Learn a little bit more about me. Reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you individually or to any groups and organizations in the city. Please join me in fighting for an affordable, livable, and sustainable Longmont, and remember to return your ballot by November 7th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Candidate Christ. <laughs> this is a new generation, Longmont. Let's be bold. Let's be bold not with our pocketbooks, but with our imagination, with our ingenuity, and with our love for each other. Let's find our circles and draw them closer. Community commercial centers will restore the fabric and structure of our neighborhoods. Policing will be easier, recreation and library, grocery, and personal care will be readily available. RV tourism will bolster the North Longmont Business Corridor, and we will finally recover from the pandemic. As a business owner and a business consultant, I have the skills to facilitate this growth. Find more information about my policies at ChristopherLongmontCouncil.com. We can rebuild the Longmont we love, and our children will return and prosper as we did. I thank Nia and Harrison for joining me tonight and um, for sharing your ideas and your time with me. Thank you, LPM. Thank you, League of Women Voters. And thank you, Faith. And this concludes our debate. <laughs> the next and final debate of the day will begin in one hour. So for those of you in the audience, you may stay in your seat leave the building or spend time in the lobby speaking to candidates and gathering candidate literature. If you decide to stay, please return to the studio no later than 15 minutes before the next debate. The lights will flash and there will be an announcement. And we'd like to thank our friends at the League of Women Voters of Boulder County and Sustainable Resilient Longmont for their help and support. <laughs>